we're almost done with our unit on limits and continuity. Uh, so we're just about ready to start diving into using these definitions to talk about what the derivative is and what it means to solve that slope problem I was discussing at the beginning of the year. But first, there are a few loose ends about limits and continuity uh, that uh, since this is an AP class, um, they want you to know these things. These aren't things that you're going to be tested on per se, but it's information about limits and continuity that you should be aware of. So let's take a look at a few of these last things. All right, right here in GeoGebra, I am looking at the graph of the function y is equal to the sine of one over x. All right, and I think you can see here that the function is getting pretty squirrely right around where x is equal to zero. And that makes sense. If we plugged zero into this, we would get one over x is essentially infinity. Um, and the sign of infinity doesn't exist. All right, so let's see if there's a limit at infinity though. So looking at this graph, I'll kind of zoom in because maybe this is going to get less confusing as we zoom in. But as I'm zooming in here, I think you're seeing that it's not getting less confusing. All of this blinking is GeoGebra getting really mad at me for wanting to graph this much of the function. Because really, this graph is getting closer and closer to just a filled in rectangle. And it's just not making any more sense. So as we get closer and closer to zero, the graph is wobbling around between one and negative one more and more and more. So based on that, we can see that as we're getting close to zero, the y value is not getting closer to a specific value. So I'm going to say that the limit as x approaches zero of sine of one over x does not exist. All right. So that's one thing I want you to see, <clears throat> that sometimes limits don't exist because there's too much oscillation going on, okay? So the limit isn't approaching a single value, it's kind of approaching all values at the same time in some sense. But what I want to do now is I want to sneak over and take a look at a related problem that does have an answer we can look at. All right, and we're going to solve this algebraically. And then based on that, we're going to go back and look at the graph and see what the graph is talking about. This is an example of what we're going to call the squeeze theorem. And you'll see why when we look at the graph. So instead of taking the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 1 over x, I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 0 of x times the sine of 1 over x. So that's f of x. And let's see what we can figure out about this function without making a graph, just by thinking about it. All right, so when x is not equal to zero, one over x is a real number. And what do we know about the sign of numbers? Well, they're bounded above and bounded below. What is the maximum possible value and the minimum possible value that this function could have? Well, we know that it's going to be less than positive 1, and it's always going to be greater than or equal to negative 1. All right, so that's kind of interesting. That's not exactly our function f, though. <clears throat> so I want to kind of multiply every side of this inequality by x. All right, so in the middle, we're going to have x times sine of 1 over x. And things are getting a little confusing because x could be positive and it could be negative. And so that affects um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the numbers on the other side. But I think you'd agree with me that if sine of 1 over x is, has a maximum value of 1 and a minimum value of negative 1, then multiplying it by x, you're going to have a value that's always less than or equal to the absolute value of x. All right, so this is always a positive number, whether x is positive or negative, and it's always greater than x times sine of 1 over x. And on the other hand, if we multiply this out, this can't be less than negative the absolute value of x. 
Okay. So whenever we put some number in here, whether it's positive or negative, we're multiplying that number x times a number that's somewhere between negative one and positive one. We don't know where, it depends on the value of x, but multiplying x times a number that's between negative one and positive one has to be less than the absolute value of the number and greater than the negative of the absolute value of the number. Do you agree with that? <clears throat> All right, so that's true for all x other than zero, because when x is equal to zero, this isn't defined at all. Well, let's take a look at these two functions. So the absolute value of x, what does that graph look like? This is something you did back in Algebra 1 if we weren't rushing too much. Well, the graph of the absolute value of x looks like this. <clears throat> And the graph of y equals negative the absolute value of x, I'll do this kind of with two lines. All right. And so what we can see is that this function in the middle is somewhere between those two values. And it's oscillating around. So maybe it's doing kind of one of these numbers. And on the other side, it's doing exactly the same thing. But what you notice is that in either event, it's always going to be inside these two lines. And so the limit as x approaches 0 of x times sine of 1 over x has really got to be 0. Even though it's wobbling around, it can't be greater than zero because <clears throat> the absolute value of zero is equal to zero. So that's the, that's the value that this function has at zero. The value this function has at zero is also zero. So the, the, when as x is getting really, really small, it can't be more than zero and it can't be less than zero. So it has to be equal to zero. So that's the idea of why this is called the squeeze theorem. So we've got these two functions and we understand, we can easily understand the limit of both of these functions as x is equal to zero and they have that same limit. So a function that's between them has to be squeezed in to that common value as you're approaching that limit, all right? So that's an example of the squeeze theorem. It gives us the ability to find the limit sometimes of complicated functions that we couldn't do using algebra in other ways um, just by noticing that it's got a function that's always greater than it and a function that's always less than it and those two functions have the same limit at the value we're thinking about. Okay. It turns out and this is another key fact that you need to remember. This is how we started out the limit unit. We were looking at a table and a graph and we were looking at the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x. This is another function that's kind of hard to work out because you know sine is a weirdly behaving function. And so we can't really use algebra to do much with these two functions. But we saw in the table and from a graph, we had a pretty good idea that that limit was going to be equal to one. Well, you can do the same thing. We can actually formally prove using some geometry and using some uh, trigonometry, we can see that this number is always less than or equal to one and it's always greater than or equal to the cosine of x when x is near zero. All right. And if you're interested about this, let me know and I can point you to some videos that do the geometry and calculus about this. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but not, you know, it's, it's more confusing if you're not really into working out the details of it. And so we can figure out what this function is doing as x approaches zero, because the cosine of zero approaches one. So you've got, once again, you've got this sandwich theorem where you've got the cosine of x doing this, you've got the function y equals one doing this, and 
the function sine equals x, sine x over x, is somewhere between them. And even though this function is hard to understand, these two functions are not. And so that's what lets us actually prove, instead of just guessing, that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. This is a critically important fact, and there's a, uh, a follow-up fact that is equally important, that the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x is equal to 0. And you can prove this also using uh, the squeeze theorem. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it turns out that these are going to be really crucial facts uh, in the next unit when we start talking about derivatives, because this is going to allow us to calculate the derivative of sine using algebra and a few trig uh, techniques. At any rate, uh, the point was that this was telling you about the squeeze theorem. So it's not something you're going to be asked to do in this class, but it's an important technique that I would want you to appreciate that it's an extra technique that you can use sometimes uh, in order to calculate complicated limits. So I hope that was I hope that was understandable. So all you needed to do was watch that and good job with that. <laughs>